Thank you to the uh, worship team for leading us in worship. That was just so awesome. And uh, as Ben said earlier, my name is Noah, and uh, I forgot about that story, about that text. I, uh, I don't know, I just, I just still remember. You know, after the first revival event we had back in January, I remember, I think I saw Ben like walking out to his car, and I just walked up to him after, and I was just like, when are we doing this again? Like, when, when's the next one? And, like, we're so excited to all be back here again, worshiping God here on a nice summer night. Um, just truly such a, such a blessing for us. And as you guys have been aware, we've been enjoying the Olympics this season. I'm sure everyone loves getting to watch the Olympics uh, every four years for the summer and then every two years uh, after that for the uh, Winter Olympics. And for me, my favorite Olympic story has to be uh, Michael Phelps. I've always loved watching Michael Phelps. I think, uh, you know, back when he was in his prime, he was just so amazing to watch out in the pool. Uh, and back in 2012, uh, it was one of his best events. It was the 200 meter uh, butterfly, and he was completely upset by this guy named Chad Leclo. It was, you know, it was, it was shocking. People were just, you know, blown away. Here was Michael Phelps, this amazing swimmer on top of the world, yet this no-name guy just came up, beat him, and Phelps, you know, seemed to be over. He even ended up retiring after that a few years later. Uh, but then we were coming up to the 2016 Olympics in Rio, and Michael Phelps decided to come back out of retirement. It was very exciting. Uh, you know, he was nailing it every event. And then it finally came time for that 200-meter butterfly, the one that he lost to Chad Leclo four years before that. And it was all over the internet. You know, the, the, the guy named Chad Leclo was doing this, like, shadow boxing right in front of him. Phelps was just locked in on his mission. You know, it was all over uh, the internet. It was really, really funny. And then Phelps would go on to win that event, and it was just this amazing story. It was all over the news, all over ESPN. Everyone was just blown away by what he did. And I think many of us have probably, probably got to see that uh, a few years ago, and we were all amazed by that. And I think the reason behind that is because deep down within us, we all, we, we, we want to see that. We want to see that kind of, of story of, of someone failing, someone getting knocked down, and then finding their way back to where they once were, finding their way back. Where that, to where they should be. And so tonight, as we look at God's word, we're gonna learn about that. We're gonna learn about how we can see that in our lives. We can see how many times in our lives and the lives around us, we see ourselves and others getting knocked down. We see how God works to bring us back to where we should be. And so tonight, we're actually gonna be in the book of Revelation. And I'm sure many people here love to, to talk about the book of Revelation. It's one of the most popular books in the Bible. Everyone loves talking about end times, giving their, their stance, their view, pre-trib, post-trib, and all that debating. And that's good, and that's great. We should be talking about the end times. That's, that's important, and there's a lot to learn there. But in the beginning of the book of Revelation, Jesus has these really strong words towards these seven churches from the first century. And I think if we study those words, if we study what, what Jesus said to those seven different churches, that there's something for each and every one of us to learn even 2,000 years ago, Jesus' words towards those churches are still valid towards us today. And so tonight we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, which reads like this. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. You have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent." So here's this Ephesian church. Any of us know who this Ephesian church is? If you flip open your Bible and, and read the New Testament, you'll get to this letter to this church in Ephesus, the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. That's the same church here. You know, they're this amazing church that the Paul says, hey, you were saved by grace through faith. We're gonna talk about the armor of God. And then here, in the beginning, Jesus is saying that you know, they were doing great things, right? He says, oh, you've been, you've, been, you've been enduring patiently. You've been calling out false teaching, if we were to equate that to today's words, it might be calling out those who are teaching a prosperity gospel, those who are teaching uh, some kind of false gospel. And so they were doing good things. They seemed to have been doing everything that they should be on the outside. And I'm sure, you know, as they were hearing this letter read to them from John, they were thinking, yes, of course, you know, we've, we've been enduring patiently. We've been uh, calling out false teaching. But then we get to verse 5, 
And Jesus says this, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. You have to ask, what happened? What happened to the Ephesians? They, they seem to have been doing everything right. And Jesus even commends them for doing everything right. Yet there's something missing. Even though on the outside they seem to have been doing what they should be doing, the inside, on the inside something was missing. Something was not there. Verse 4, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love. You have abandoned the love the love you had at first. <laughs> now, I remember about a year ago, I watched this movie for the first time. It wasn't a very popular movie. I'd never heard of it before I watched it, but I saw it on Netflix, and I was thinking, hey, let's give it a, let's give it a whirl, see, see if it's any good. And the movie was actually called Forever My Girl. And, and it tells this love story between these two young people named Liam and Josie. And I just remember in the first opening scene, we, we were there on their wedding day, you know, uh, Josie has her wedding dress on, her, her bridesmaids are all around her, and they're getting ready for the, the big ceremony, and they're exciting. But then the door flies open, and I think it was her maid of honor, walks into the room, and she just has this look on her face. Just, she, she just had this horrible look, like something horrible just happened. And she would go on to tell Josie that Liam had left. He had left to, to pursue this, this life on the road, being this rock star musician, playing in concerts all over the world, leaving Josie abandoned at the altar. And you could just feel in that scene just the, the broken heart that she must have felt. Liam had professed his love for her and made this commitment to marry her, but then the day came and he abandoned her. The church in Ephesus was not all that different from Liam. They had professed their love for Jesus. They were doing all the right things. But their hearts abandoned Jesus. Their love for Jesus wasn't there. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Have you ever thought about that from Jesus' perspective? I think when we, we read scripture, we always think about things from our perspective, from man's perspective. We never really think about things from, from God's perspective. Jesus had emotions. What's the shortest Bible verse in, in the entire Bible? Jesus wept. Jesus felt things. He wasn't a robot. Imagine it from his perspective. He died on the cross. He did everything to save this church in Ephesus. And they come to him in faith. But then just a little while later, they abandon him after everything that he did for them. All the suffering. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Let me ask you a difficult question tonight, one that I don't think a lot of us would like to answer. And that question is, do you have a little bit of the Ephesian church in you? If you take out a mirror and take an honest look in your heart, do you see that maybe you've abandoned God Maybe it's not wholeheartedly like, the, wholeheartedly like the church in Ephesus. But maybe it was in, it's in little ways, small ways, ways that you push off, ways that you, you brush aside, you, you act like aren't there. I know for me, when I look back just a, a few years ago, it was my, my junior year of college at Liberty University. I had some trials that I was going through in my life, and it was, it was hard and it was tough, but I was just so blown away because God used those trials and he used those circumstances in ways in which I never could have imagined. He drew me so close to him during that year, and he just brought me so close to him. My, my heart was just drawn straight to the cross, to Jesus Christ, and it just birthed this newfound love and fire and passion for the gospel. I just remember the year after that, I was a, it was my senior year, and I was an RA at Liberty, and I just, truly, the only thing that I cared about was the gospel. I remember we had about 80 kids on the hall, and I knew not all of them were saved. And for those who weren't saved in my hall, I just, every chance I had, I just wanted them to hear the good news about Jesus. And for those who did know Jesus, I wanted them to know Christ more and more. And there was this fire and this flame that I just couldn't explain, I couldn't put out. Not that I wanted to put it out, but it was just unbelievable. But then over the next couple years after that, slowly, 
I saw that fire start to dim to where even today I look at myself and I don't see that same fire. Just a few short years ago, the gospel was my biggest passion in my life. I don't see that to the same degree anymore. Sure, I care about the gospel, but not as much as I used to. And I hate that. I'm not okay with that. I don't want that. Let me ask you one more time. Have you abandoned your love of Jesus in some way? Maybe for you, you just don't have that passion for Jesus that you used to. Other things have gripped your heart. Maybe for you, it's your desire for a relationship. That's the thing that grips your heart. It's your desire for money, for success, for getting that degree, getting into that school. That's what you love most. Maybe for you, you used to be loving and patient and kind and gracious towards others, yet now you don't have the patience for them. Maybe it's in your thought life. You used to take every thought captive and made it obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ as scripture called you to, but now it's just not the same. Because I think if we are honest and we look inside our hearts, we see a little bit of the Ephesians within us. We see that we have abandoned our love in some way some shape, some form. So let me ask all of us, are we okay with that? Are we okay with that? Because I think, I think we have a couple of temptations with this. I think the first one is just to do nothing. I think we just, we get lazy, we just think, you know what, I've got other things to worry about. I'm a parent now. I don't have time to, to deal with these things. I've got school. I've got this new job. I've got distractions. And the other temptation I think we have is to to do some, some sort of quick revive. You know, I remember a few years ago, my, my friends and I, we used to play this game called Call of Duty, and there was this potion you could drink called Quick Revive, and it would just revive you real quick. And I remember sometimes they would do it to me, and then I would just get knocked down right again, and they were just like, why did I just revive you? And I think some of us have a similar view with revival. We're here at a night of revival where we come out here and we worship and we praise, and we get fired up, and then Monday rolls around, and it's like Friday never happened. Are we okay with this? I pray that we're not. So how do we get real revival? That's why we're here. That's the name of the event. A night of revival. How do we get that? How do we get revival that lasts? Something that when Monday comes around, we're still revived. We're still experiencing Jesus. We're still experiencing the Holy Spirit. Well, tonight, I want us to look at one specific example in Scripture of someone who was knocked down far worse than anyone in here ever could be knocked down, yet experienced that revival from Jesus Christ himself. And that's the Apostle Peter. And if you're not familiar with the Apostle Peter's story, he has this crazy life story of how he was once this fisherman. He was this fisherman, and he had a brother named Andrew, and they were nobody. They were just ordinary men, and they were just fishermen. But then they met Jesus. They met Jesus, and Jesus called them to follow him. And so Peter started following Jesus. And if you've ever seen the show, The Chosen, it seems like he had this, this, this fire and this passion and this excitement for Jesus. In fact, Jesus even had this high calling for his life. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said this about the apostle Peter. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Can you imagine that? I think all of us want to know what God's will is for our life, yet Peter got to hear from Jesus Christ what God's will for his life, and that was to be the rock on which he would build his church. And so God had a high calling for Peter's life, and Peter responded to that with passion, with love, with fire, to the point where before Jesus would be arrested, Peter would say this, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Peter loved Jesus. He was on fire for Jesus. He was ready to even die for Jesus. But then, things took a bad turn. And we arrived at Passion Week of Jesus' life. And Jesus would be 
wrongly arrested, taken into chains. And then all of Jesus' disciples fled. And then there was Peter. And this group of people came up to Peter and asked him, do you know this man? Do you know Jesus? Peter said no. Three times. He had three chances to say, yes, I know Jesus. Three chances to prove what he said, that even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. He had three chances, and every single time, he failed. He was supposed to be the rock on which the church would be built, yet that rock was destroyed. There was no rock for the church to be built on. No rock. The rock was gone, split in half, failed. But then, Jesus and Peter would have this conversation. And Jesus would say some words to Peter. And then if you read the rest of the Bible, you see that Peter would be the rock. He would be the pillar on which the church would be built. In the book of Acts, he would go and proclaim the name of Jesus and that fire that he once had was back, and it was stronger than ever, because he would go on to die for the name of Jesus Christ. Before the cross, he denied Jesus. After the cross, after that conversation with Jesus, he was willing to die for Jesus. So what was that conversation? What were those words that Jesus said to Peter that flipped things around, that gave him that revival? that revival that would last. That revival didn't end two, two days later for Peter. That revival last, lasted until he would be crucified upside down in the name of Jesus. What were the words that Jesus said to Peter? Well, they come from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. What do you think Peter was expecting to hear in this moment? Here he just had his biggest failure of his entire life. And the one in which he just failed is about to speak to him. What do you think he was expecting to hear? And maybe he was expecting Jesus to say, after all that I've done for you, how could you deny me, Peter? How could you do that? Why did you do that? You failure. Or maybe he was expecting him to say, after what you've done, if you want to start following me again, you've got to make up for it, Peter. But no, Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus doesn't bring words of hate and condemnation towards Peter. He doesn't give him a list of things that he needs to do in order to get back into right standing with Jesus. No, he doesn't say that. Jesus has no words of condemnation, no words of hate, no words of attack against Peter. When you fail, what kind of words do you hear? What does your inner voice say to you when you fail? Maybe you feel this sense of self-condemnation. You feel this heavy weight, this burden, like you're this horrible failure who God doesn't love. Or maybe for you, you feel this, this pull towards self-righteousness, Oh, after what I just did, now I need to start going to church every single Sunday again. I need to start listening to more worship. I need to be reading my Bible more. I need to be praying more. I need to be fasting more. I've got to make up for this. But you see, the problem with our inner voice is that it is just not right. We have this thing called the flesh, and that flesh lies to us. There's also this thing called the devil, and the devil lies to us. You see, the apostle Peter here he gets to hear the words directly from Jesus himself. And Jesus did not bring words of condemnation. He did not bring words of hate or attack, but he brought words of grace, of mercy, of love. I 
When Peter fails, what does Jesus point him to? Jesus could have pointed him to anything. And I think the thing that we all would have expected Jesus to point to is his failure. Jesus would have come up to him and said, Peter, three times, three times you, you failed. Three times you denied me. What were you thinking? What were you doing? Why did you deny me? But that's not what Jesus pointed to. What did Jesus point to? He pointed to two things. First, he pointed to his love. He asked him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Because that's what really matters. It's not all about your failures. It's not all about your weaknesses. We all have those. And if we keep staring at those, we're just going to continue failing. We're just going to get weaker. Yet what does Jesus point Peter to? He points him back to himself. He points him back to his love. Because if we keep looking at our failures and our weaknesses, that's all we're going to see. Yet Jesus decided to lift Peter's eyes up and point him back to what he really needed to see. And that was the love of his life. The love that, yes, he did fail not too long ago, but the love in which Jesus, through his grace, through his mercy, through his forgiveness, would set him back on a path in which he would get to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and be brought back to where he should have been all along, which was preaching, proclaiming the name of Jesus, experiencing his grace and forgiveness, following Jesus, and being the rock in which Jesus would build his church. Peter, do you love me? Those are the words that he needed to hear. Those are the words that set him back towards the love of his life. The love of his life was not denying Jesus. The love of his life was Jesus. But there's a second thing that Jesus pointed Peter towards. Not just his love, but his calling. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. That was Jesus' plan for Peter's life all along. On this rock, I will build my church. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. I think deep down within each and every one of us, we have this, this longing for this life I think oftentimes a lot of things in this world just don't quite seem to fill it. Even though we keep trying with our careers, with our money, with our looks, with our school, with our success, with our friends, even as Christians. But did you know that the Lord has a calling for your life? You see, for the Ephesians... We see our universal calling, which is to love God, to follow him, to have faith in Christ. That is the calling God has for each and every one of us. Nothing in this world will take place of that. Nothing in this world can take place of that. That is the calling that God has in our lives. But he also has a specific calling for each and every one of us. For the Apostle Peter, it was to be the rock on which Jesus would build his church. But what is that calling for you? Where are you in your life right now? Where has God placed you? Maybe you're a parent, and God is calling you to raise up your children in the name of Jesus Christ. Or maybe you're gonna be going off to college in a few days or a few weeks, and God has called you to live for him on your campus. Maybe for you, you're just starting out in life and you're just starting a new job and God has called you to be faithful in the workplace, to love your coworkers like Jesus loved you. So let me ask you the question that we started with. If you look inside your heart, are you willing to admit that maybe you failed with that calling in some way? Hear the gracious words of Jesus Christ tonight. Do you love me? Do you love Jesus? Because the good news is that Jesus Christ came down here 2,000 years ago, not asking, do you love me, but saying, I love you. I love you so much 
that I am going to go and die on the cross for your failures. I am going to go and die on the cross for each and every single time in which you have failed to live out your calling. I am going to go and die on the cross so that if you will repent and come back to me. When Jesus called the Ephesians to repent and come back to him, he, call, he has given that calling to everyone, that invitation to everyone, so that whoever says yes, Lord, I will come back. Yes, I've been going down the wrong path. Yes, I've been going the wrong way. But when I hear your calling to repent, to turn from the direction in which I was going and to come back to the cross and place my faith in you, it's when we do that. It's when we repent and believe on the name of Jesus Christ that we are given this Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that carried Peter on to live for the name of Jesus Christ after his failure can live in you. And if you have called on the name of Jesus Christ, does live in you right here, right now. And it's through that Spirit that we can re experience revival Revival. revival that will last beyond Monday. Revival that will last until we meet Jesus face to face. Because if you have called on the name of Jesus Christ, you have been given the amazing gift of the Holy Spirit, and that Spirit is your comforter, it is your guide, it is your light upon your path. So church, may we call on the name of Jesus Christ each and every day. I don't care what your failure was, I don't care how small, I don't care how big it was. It's when you say, yes, Jesus, I do love you. Yes, Jesus, I will receive your forgiveness and your love that we can experience his Holy Spirit, and that Spirit is far more powerful than you could ever imagine. And it is that Spirit, and it is that Jesus Christ who will give us revival. Repent and do the works you did at first. That's the calling of Jesus. It's not condemnation, it's not hate, it's grace, and a calling to come back to him. Yes, we may have strayed and gone off path, but he's calling us back tonight. And it's through his blood and his death and his resurrection that we can come back. So as we close out tonight, I want to invite the worship team to come back up. And as they're coming up, I want to ask you a very simple question. When Jesus says, repent, do the works you did at first, what will your response be? Will you receive his words and come back to him and follow him and allow the spirit to work mighty works in and through you? I pray that you will. I pray that all of us will because that's what we want. As the Apostle Paul said, forgetting what lies behind straining towards what is ahead. What is ahead? Eternity with Jesus. So let's live each and every day with our eyes locked on that, and let's live each and every day on fire for that. Whatever your calling is, let's live for the name of Jesus Christ. And let's see what his spirit can do when we follow after him, fueled by his grace and his mercy. Would you pray with me? Father, we just come before you, Lord, and we admit that we're unworthy of your love. In our own ways, we've all failed to love you the way in which we should. But Lord, we thank you for the amazing grace that you have shown us on the cross. We thank you for the amazing love that you have given us. And Lord, I pray for every single person in the room here tonight that we may receive your love, we may follow you, and that your grace, your mercy, and your love may drive us to live lives for you. May we fix our eyes on you, on your love, and may your spirit come and do things that only you can do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.